So welcome everybody. Uh, now we start the student webinar. This is the BioXL student webinar. So our students that have participated to the summer school 2022nd edition. And uh, those uh, the students have won a poster prize and the poster prize was a webinar. So the presenter of today are Costanza Paternoster from the University of Trento, Raquel Perry from the University of Newcastle, and Serena Arquitu from the Franklin Institute for Advanced Study uh, from the International Max Planck Research School for Cellular Biophysics. I'm hosting this webinar together with Marta from the European Bioinformatics Institute. The webinar will be recorded. And during the webinar, you can use the Q&A function that is located on the bottom of the Zoom panel. And depends on the operating system that you have, you can see this symbol or you can see this symbol. And since we have three speakers, I will ask you when you type your question to put at one for Costanza, at two for Rachel, and at three for Serena. And uh, at the end of the three presentation, we will read, Marta will read the question and uh, chair the Q&A section. So everybody can hear the question and the speaker in charge will answer. Okay, so we have three different topics today. So Costanza will speak about pore forming toxin, in particular investigating the action mechanism with molecular dynamic simulation. Raquel will speak, will speak about Riemannian geometry for molecular surface approximation. And Serena will speak about mechanist insight into the early events of the activation of the C-methyl receptor during Listeria invasion. So now I give my, the word to Costanza, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Now I will share my presentation. I'm going to talk about uh, a part of my research project, uh, which concerns, uh, which is focused on the so-called pore forming toxins uh, and uh, how I'm investigating uh, them uh, with uh, the aid of molecular dynamics uh, simulations. So the pore forming toxins are particular kind of proteins that are released uh, by bacteria during the host infection. And there is a huge variety of these uh, toxins that differ from for sizes and structure, but they all share a similar mechanism. They are released uh, as uh, soluble monomers uh, by bacteria and uh, they uh, attack and able to bind the membrane of the cells of the host. There they assemble in an oligomer and form uh, transmembrane channels so that, like the one that uh, you can see in the picture that eventually led to the death of the cell. So in particular, I am studying the gamma hemolysin, which is a performing toxin used by Staphylococcus aureus to evade the immune system of the host. And gamma hemolysin is released as two separate, separate soluble components, the so-called UCAF in blue and HLG2 component that are able to target and kill the leukocytes, so the immune cells of the host and to form uh, the transmembrane channel depicted here. So as you can see, they have a high structural similarity, but also a low sequence similarity, which in the end accounts for the different roles that they have in the binding and in the assembly process. So here uh, it is shown, uh, um, are shown some key domains of the two components. Uh, the cup is the more rigid uh, one. The rim domain, it is the one uh, which is involved in the interaction with the membrane. The stem in green is the one that undergoes a, a conformational change and then constitutes the transmembrane channel. And also the amino latch is reported because it's unfolding. It is important to allow uh, the, um, the interaction between uh, the monomers in the pore. So uh, in brief, um, the, this is the mechanism of the pore formation. There is an initial stage, as I said before, where the, um, the toxins are released as soluble, water-soluble units by the bacteria. So then they have to bind the membrane. Then the two, component, two components interact 
on the membrane in order to form a heterodimer, and then the heterodimers have to interact in order to form an octamer, so uh, an, uh, an oligomer, that uh, uh, led to a pre so-called prepore, where the stem in green is partially refold, as you can see. And then this brings to the final uh, transmembrane channels where all the, the stems are completely fold. So, uh, unfortunately, there, uh, there are um, just several stages of this uh, process that uh, have been captured by experiments. And uh, so molecular, we can say, dynamics simulation can complement this experiment uh, by reproducing the dynamic process. And from, uh, from these dynamics, we can extract some relevant information. For example, we can ask uh, uh, we can ask ourselves something about the ensuring mechanism or also the interaction and then the conformational changes of the, of the toxin. In particular, I, my goal, my, my aim is to study uh, the formation of a membrane-bound dimer from the interaction of the two components on the membrane. And to do this, uh, I'm uh, employing full atomistic molecular dynamics uh, simulations. The problem is that uh, we lack a proper experimental structures of the bound dimer for comparison, and it's also so difficult to think uh, where to start for this dimer and which features uh, we, uh, I should inspect. So I started from the results uh, of uh, Thomas Tarenti, who is a, a postdoc in the group where uh, where I, um, I work. He performed some uh, cross-grained molecular dynamics simulations of uh, the process of binding of the two single components, UCAF and HLD2. So he tested their ability to bind uh, the bilayer membrane using, using a purely lipidic bilayer membrane, which are uh, uh, a uh, mixed composition of partially unsaturated uh, uh, lipids, which are the phosphatidylcholine and uh, uh, cholesterol. So what he found uh, was, uh, uh, or is, that there are some differences in the binding ability of these two components, as we can see from the distance of the components uh, um, between the components and the, and the membrane over time, that UCAF is able to form a stable binding, whereas the other component is not. So uh, if we also add the experimental evidence uh, that the gamma hemolysin has uh, a permealizing uh, activity also on this uh, model membrane, or we can say on membranes uh, which are purely lipidic, we, uh, we can say that this suggests that uh, the, uh, the binding of uh, the LUCAF uh, component is necessary, is preliminary for subsequent uh, binding of HLG2. So I used the information uh, to start uh, my research to find an heterodimer. So I started from a membrane bound LUCAF uh, component on uh, the same kind of uh, membrane. And I ran uh, some uh, atomistic uh, molecular dynamic simulation of the single monomer. So then the resulting structure uh, was the starting, uh, we can say, structure for the, um, the interaction with the other component. So the question was uh, where to put uh, the HLD2 uh, monomer, which has to be in solution. Uh, my simulation and also Thomas one showed that the LUCAF bound to the membrane uh, had a tilted orientation, which exposed a solvent, uh, uh, which exposed a surface. And this surface was found also as one of the interprotomer interfaces in the final pore, because we have the structure, the crystal structure of the final pore. Uh, so this uh, uh, surface can also be thought as a dimerization interface. Moreover, so this is the angle, the tilted uh, monomer. So moreover, this surface also contains the amino latch uh, that I mentioned before, uh, which is disordered in the final pore. And uh, so it is uh, uh, supposed that uh, its unfolding is needed to uh, totally expose the interface. So I placed the second monomer close to this uh, exposed uh, uh, interface, uh, surface. And moreover, uh, because, uh, because of the fact that LUCAF is not tilted in the final pore, um, probably the interaction with HLD2 uh, should induce uh, a reorientation. 
So I was able to run uh, one microsecond of simulation. So I simulated the interacting monomers and uh, uh, I wasn't able to find an heterodimer in the sense a uh, membrane bound heterodimer, but uh, in uh, a replica, I could find uh, uh, the two uh, monomers interacting. So I monitored the, the uh, structural mobility of the two monomers, starting from UCAF especially, I found uh, looking at the root mean square fluctuations, so the average displacement of the residues uh, during the simulations, that the uh, amino latch, so the N term and the C term, uh, were particular, uh, we can say, uh, fluctuating. Uh, also, with uh, respect of uh, uh, the same uh, RMSF that I found uh, in the simulation of the single UCAF. So, we, uh, I saw a more mobile, uh, more mobile terminal terms. So also the RMSD confirmed uh, this, uh, this behavior. And also here are reported uh, two um, configurations of the amino latch during, during simulations. So two representative uh, configurations. And I also so investigated the structural mobility of uh, the other monomer, it was uh, that uh, interesting was to find um, a jump in the RMSD of uh, one particular part of uh, the HLZ2 monomer, which, which is the rim domain, the one that should interact uh, with the membrane. So this, uh, uh, we can say, reveals uh, uh, kind of local rearrangement in the rim domain. So I wanted also to inspect the interface area to uh, to tell if uh, the two uh, monomers uh, were really interacting during the simulation. So I estimated this interface area using the SASA, the Solvent Accessible Surface Area. So uh, to compute this interface, I simply uh, calculated the SASA for a single UCAF, the single HLD2. I summed up these two and I subtracted the one from the dimer. So, and uh, moreover, I wanted to compute the contributions of the different uh, domains to uh, this interface. And uh, what uh, was the result uh, was that, uh, that the majority of the contribution comes from the rim domain of both the, uh, the components. So I also investigated or uh, computed the uh, angles between uh, the axis of the LUCAF, which was tilted at the beginning of the simulation, and uh, with respect of the membrane normal. And here I reported the distribution of this angle. In red, uh, the distribution of uh, the LUCAF uh, axis angle during uh, the simulation where I uh, just simulated the single LUCAF. So you can see that it is really tilted, the, uh, the monomer. And then in gray, I reported uh, this distribution of the same angle, but uh, when UCAF is interacting with uh, the other component and during, no, sorry, during uh, the simulation time, we can see that uh, this distribution uh, shifts toward lower angles. And I also reported the value of the, of the orientation angle that UCAF has in the, in the final pore. So, I ran some molecular dynamic simulations in order to, uh, to find, to investigate the interaction of the LUCAF and HLD2 components of the gamma hemolysin in order to obtain an heterodimer. Uh, I haven't reached yet a proper stable membrane bound dimer formation, but some preliminary results, uh, uh, there are some preliminary results. We can say that there is an high mobility uh, in the LUCAF terminal beta sheets, one of which it is the amino latch, is supposed to have a, a pivotal role in the pore formation because it has to unwind to better expose the dimerization interface. And also I found that the rim domain of LUCAF, but uh, especially the HLD2 component has a dominant role in the interface so that has to be elucidated. And also that I saw some reorientation uh, of the LUCAF due to the presence of HLD2. So thank you very much, I finished. And I have to thank my okay, uh, supervisor, who is Professor Gianluca Lattanzi, and uh, the, uh, Thomas Tarenzi, who worked uh, with me and uh, at this research. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you very much, Costanza. Okay. And now we go on with Rachel. Good afternoon, everybody, um, and thank you for the introduction. Um, today I'm going to be talking about um, the work that we've been doing as part of my PhD, developing a new method for approximating the 3D shape of molecules by applying the mathematical theory of Ramanian geometry. So it's often the case at the beginning of a drug discovery project that with the structure of the protein that we're trying to target is unavailable, which prevents the use of structure-based methods like docking or FEP in the identification of potential hits. Instead, what we often have are a small handful of molecules that are known to bind to our target. These could come from initial experiments. They could be natural products that we want to mimic, or often as the case, they might be another company's drug that we want to compete with. And we can use these molecules as templates to screen large databases for other potential hits on the basis that molecules that are similar in some way are likely to share biological activity. However, the problem with similarity is that much like beauty, it lies in the eye of the beholder. And there are many equally sensible ways to justify how similar two molecules are. One approach that's gained popularity recently is comparison based on molecular shape. The shape of a molecule is a good predictor of whether it's likely to display activity for the protein target as it needs to be the right size and shape in order to fit into the binding pocket. There's currently no absolute definition of 3D shape and instead we depend on mathematical approximations to condense the shape down to a vector of numbers that we can then compare. There are currently three main categories of shape similarity methods. There are those that depend on the overlap of volume between two molecules, those that use the distribution of atomic distances from a set of fixed reference points, and those that make use of the molecule's surface to compare shape. Compared to other approaches, the use of the surface is still in its infancy in drug discovery applications. As molecules don't have a true surface in the same way that an apple has a skin, but it's still a useful feature to consider in order to describe its size and shape. The surface offers a good compromise between the other two approaches, as it captures a lot of the same shape features as the volume does, but it's less expensive to calculate. So the primary focus of my PhD has been the development of a new surface-based shape similarity method using the mathematical theory of Riemannian geometry. This allows us to produce a vector descriptor of molecular shape that's quick to calculate, easy to compare, invariant to rotation and translation of the molecule, and that doesn't require the optimal alignment of two molecules to be found before their comparison. And we've implemented this in Python, and the code for the project is all available via GitHub, and I will share the link to that at the end. Um, I won't have time today to go too much into the maths, um, but the basis of our approach is that there's an object associated with the surface known as the Riemannian metric that captures in detail the geometry of the surface. It's possible to approximate this, but by treating our molecule as a series of intersecting spheres of van der Waals radius to begin with, we can obtain the metric in its explicit form, um, which captures a lot more detail. These metrics themselves can't be compared, but they can be used to compute the laplace Beltrami spectrum associated with the surface which gives us a nine element vector representation of eigenvalues that describe the shape of the molecular surface. These descriptors are easy to compare for two molecules using the inverse Bray Curtis distance, which gives us a score of zero if they have no similarity and therefore are likely not to show biological activity for the same target, or one when they're identical and very likely to have the same activity. So in the development of our method, there were a few factors that we needed to consider. Um, the mathematics itself only considers surfaces that are free of holes, and um, so we treat any rings such as benzene or pyridine as a single sphere with a radius of 2.25 angstroms, um, which we can see as the bigger spheres in the pictures that I have here. Um, this does give us the limitation that anything that is truly shaped like a donut is off limits, and um, so we can't consider uh, macrocyclic molecules with our method. Um, while the descriptors are rotation and translation invariant, they do depend on the choice of the initial atom that we use to construct our descriptor from. And for consistency, we take this as the atom closest to the geometric center, and which I've shown in gray in the image in the middle here. And the description of the shape is best about this point and the quality tails off the further away that you get. And finally, in order to simplify the maths, all of the surfaces that we're considered, considering are treated as having a surface area of four pi, so we include their true weighted surface area in the final description to account for differences in size. As an initial test of how well our method might perform, we made use of a series of PDE5 inhibitors of known shape. Um, so 
we took um, Viagra as our starting example and two of the follow-up drugs. Um, Vardenafil, which is a classic Me Too follow-up to Sildenafil that only has a few small modifications in its structure. And Tadalafil, um, which has a completely different scaffold but is known to occupy a similar volume in the binding pocket um, and has a much better performance as a drug. A Sildenafil to Tadalafil jump is a good example of the main advantage of using shape similarity. Because we're considering broad shape rather than any sort of specific chemical detail, these kind of changes in structure can be identified. Um, this is particularly useful when we're um, either trying to compete with an existing drug to establish an IP position, um, and is also helpful to address unwanted issues such as problems with toxicity or um, insolubility. Um, so in theory, both um, but Vardenafil and Tadalafil should be classed as having similar shape to Sildenafil. Um, so compared to other approaches of doing shape similarity um, and a chemical fingerprint based method, um, at first pass our method seems to do quite well and classifies these three molecules as having quite similar shape. Um, in all cases here, a score of zero means there's no similarity and one means they're identical. Um, so while USR cat and shape it, two of the other shape similarity methods give the same relative ranking as we do, um, the scores that we get are much lower than the typical threshold of 0 0.7 that's used in chem informatics to identify similarity. Um, so while this study enough, isn't enough in its own um, to prove the method's capabilities, it certainly does indicate that there is potential. One of the other main benefits of using shape-based similarity is the ability to account for different conformers. And um, so we also wanted to investigate how our method would cope with this. To do this, we took 10 random and 10 low energy conformers for each of the three PDE5 inhibitors um, produced using our DKIP. Um, and from the overlays here, we can see that we'd maybe expect slightly higher similarity amongst the low energy conformers than we would in the random ones. So the plots that I've shown here show the pairwise shape similarity comparison for each pair of conformers in the set compared to the root mean square deviation of their atomic positions. Um, and what we see is that for the most part, shape similarity between conformers of the same molecule is generally quite high, despite true differences in their atomic positions. This is likely a result of the insensitivity of our method to small deformations in the surface, um, which in theory could be quite advantageous as it would allow us to ignore conformers where only minor changes have occurred. And we could capture the same shape information with a much lower number of conformers, um, which would offer a big efficiency advantage when we're screening through big databases. Um, so we also wanted to investigate how well our method might do in a real life virtual screen. Um, as a small test case, we took a set of 43 further PDE5 inhibitors with no nanomolar activity and used sildenafil, vardenafil and tadalafil as queries to rank them. As these are known actives, we would hope that the method would assign them as such with a score greater than 0 0.7. Um, so the top five scoring molecules compared to each query, we do observe very high similarity of over 0 0.9 in each case. Um, and inspecting the space filling models by eye suggests that these do genuinely have similar shapes. It's also worth noting here that we do get a slightly different top five for tadalafil compared to our two other closer structural analogues. And um, so diversity amongst our queries will also be quite important in a real screen to obtain a diverse set of potential hits. And we also use this study to take an initial look at how many conformers we might need to use in order to get good results from a real virtual screen. And um, so we compared the scores obtained using just a single random conformer of each of the test and query molecules. The binding pose of the query taken from the crystal structure, which is the ideal case if it is available, um, compared to multiple conformers of the test molecules. And then finally, we generated a series of multiple conformers for both the test and the query using our DKIP. Um, the number of conformers that we took in each case was determined by the flexibility of the molecules, with an average of around 200 used um, per molecule. Um, so compared to the single random pair, the consideration of multiple conformers led to consistently higher similarity scores, which shows that the consideration of multiple conformers will be important to capture the true shape and find all of the possible hits. Um, we can see that the pattern that we obtained for the multiple conformer comparison also closely matches that of the binding pose queries, which suggests that we've completed sufficient sampling of the conformational space in order to capture the binding pose that the molecules take up. So hopefully that I've managed to convince you that the similar property principle is a useful tool in drug discovery um, and is an efficient way of screening large databases. Um, we've introduced 
the use of Riemannian geometry as a method for molecular shape approximation, um, which gives us a nine element vector descriptor of molecular shape that's alignment free, quick to calculate and easy to compare. Um, our initial case study shows promise of the method compared to others in the field um, in considering conformers and as a tool for virtual screening. So the next steps for the project, um, we do have a second method of describing shape in the pipeline um, that doesn't depend as heavily on the choice of starting position, and um, which we think might address some of the issues that we've had with that. Um, I then have to complete a full validation study using the directory of useful decoys um, to compare our approach to shape, existing shape similarity methods um, and validate its performance. Um, hopefully, if this is successful, we'll then apply the project in real drug discovery projects working with the Newcastle Centre for Cancer. Um, there's also quite a bit of scope to expand the method to include consideration of pharmacophoric properties as well as shape in order to further improve the quality of the suggestions that we get out of a virtual screen. Um, so to finish, I would just like to thank my supervisors, Danny Stewart and Matt, for all of their help and support with the project. And um, we'd also like to thank Dr. Thomas Murphy at CS Fullerton for his input on the mathematics side of the project. Um, I would like to thank the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council for paying me, um, and the Alan Turing Institute and the Molecular Science for Medicine CDT for all of their help and support throughout my uh, PhD. Um, and then the QR code here at the end contains the link to the GitHub repository, uh, the paper covering the method and my contact information as well. And um, thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Now we go, we move on to our last speaker, Serena, please. Good afternoon, everybody. So let me directly introduce uh, the main character of my research, uh, which is the human symmetry receptor. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. Oops. So uh, this symmetry receptor is a tyrosine kinase receptor that is placed on the plasma membrane of tissue specific epithelial cells. And in these cells, it regulates cell growth, migration, migration, sorry, replication, and uh, um, as well as cell survival. When they regulate, and instead, this receptor leads to metastasis, metastasis development. And um, as in the case, uh, of my project, it can mediate the uh, internalization of bacteria such as the Listeria monocytogenes. And this bacterium is an intracellular bacterium that exploits the internal in B, so an invasion protein that is known to bind to the symmetric receptor and ultimately leads to the internalization of the bacterium. What we don't know is how this happens. So my big aim, or better, the big aim of my project is that to understand the activation mechanism by this invasion protein, the internal in B. Our hypothesis is that once bound to the symmetric receptor, uh, the receptor is forced to assume uh, um, active conformation that makes it more favorable for dimers to form. And once the dimers have formed, which are homodimers, uh, then at the level of the cytosolic domains where the tyrosine kinases are placed, uh, the signaling cascade can be triggered and the internalization can happen. So, um, in order to uh, go through my results, I need to give you some more details on the topology of the receptor. And in particular, uh, what is important here is that uh, for my research, for the results that I'm going to show you and explain you, the, uh, I've focused on the upper portion of the ectodomain of the receptor, as it is actually divided in three regions, which are the ectodomain that elongates outside the cell, the plasma, sorry, the transmembrane region that uh, anchors the receptor to the plasma membrane, and finally, the cytosolic domain that contains the juxta membrane uh, domain and the tyrosine kinase. And for my research, the main point, uh, the, the, the important part is uh, composed by these three domains, the SEMA domain that you see in atomistic um, representation on the side in yellow, then the PSI domain, and finally the first immunoglobulin-like domain. Why this? Because these three domains are the only ones involved in the uh, binding with the internal. In. in particular, this happens via two interfaces, one that is placed between the inter-repeat region and the SEMA domain, and one that is placed between the leucine rich repeat region, so the concave side of the uh, internal in, and uh, and the uh, first immunoglobulin-like domain. But something here is missing, let's say in the scheme, which is a quite important detail, that is the fact that this receptor is not just a protein, but is a glycoprotein, meaning that uh, on the ectodomain and on the juxtamembrane domain in particular, 
this receptor has 13 N glycosylation sites spread around these two regions. And uh, uh, in the portion that is important for uh, relevant for uh, let's say this. Uh, talk, uh, we have eight N-glycosylation sites, so that if we were to give a closer look to the receptor, it would look like this, with these green, uh, let's say, uh, chains that are the glycans. So that um, in our goals, or among our goals, we have to understand what is the role of the glycans. Additionally, we want to also to understand what is the active conformations assumed by the receptor upon binding with internal MB. And finally, what is and uh, if it's possible to discriminate between active and inactive conformations. So in order to do so, we decided to use atomistic uh, molecular dynamic simulations. And uh, um, our idea was to compare the trajectories um, explore, let's say, uh, assumed uh, by the receptor in four different situations. One is the naked uh, receptor in isolation, the naked receptor but in complex with internalin, and finally the uh, same two uh, situations but in presence of full glycosylation. So uh, our approach was that of considering all the configurations assumed by the receptor, so the red portion in each of these uh, models, and then uh, put all of these configurations together in one data set and apply on, a, on the data set a non-linear dimensionality reduction in order to uh, obtain a representation, a lower dimensional representation of the explored configurational space. Sorry again. Okay, this is what we have obtained. So a two-dimensional representation of the configurational space. And uh, on this, I then applied a clustering technique uh, with which I identified three high density clusters, which represent the conformations explored by uh, the receptor. And uh, the good part, or rather the advantage of this approach is that uh, for each of these points in the new representation, we are able to map back to the original configuration, which allows us to, uh, or enables us to uh, identify for each of the conformations, which are the models that explore that conformation. And these are reported in this, in this table here. Additionally, we are also able to identify the representative configurations for each of the conformations. So to gather them between closed and open conformations. And finally, uh, or better, lastly, we are able also from this representation to understand what are the global motions that lead one, um, let's say, the, the receptor to pass from one conformation to another by building the pseudo trajectories uh, along the coordinates um, that span this two dimensional representation of the configuration of space. And out of this analysis, I have two comments. The first one concerns the glycans role. In particular, if you look at the table, you will notice that the naked receptor in isolation, so the one uh, of which the name is in red, explored uh, all of the conformations, while the glycosylated receptor in isolation only explored the, the purple configuration, the uh, conformation, sorry, which means that the glycans are actually reducing strongly the um, configurational space explored by the isolated receptor. And as we will see later, this is uh, definitely non-trivial. Then uh, we have the second consideration instead concerns the uh, representatives of the conformations. In particular, uh, the fact that the conformation assumed by the complexes, which is the one in CN in the, in the representation, is actually the only one open. Open in what sense? The, based on the angle spanned by the axis, uh, let's say, trespassing uh, the uh, semi-domain from top to bottom and the immunoglobulin-like domain from one side to the other as if it was a cylinder. So looking at this angle, we are able actually to discriminate between active and inactive conformations. And we call this angle theta angle. And remarkably, looking at comparing our findings for the two uh, complexes distributions of this angle, we have across a three microseconds uh, trajectory for each of the two structures, we notice that the angle assumed by uh, the two complexes, so the distribution of these angles for the two complexes 
as uh, is actually overlapping with the uh, or is complying with the angle observed or assumed by the um, native holodimer. So the dimer formed by the receptor in presence of the uh, endogenous ligand, which is the hepatocyte growth factor. This is remarkable in the sense that um, this might mean uh, suggests that the uh, active conformation assumed by the receptor is actually ligand independent. On the other side, always looking at the theta angle, we can see that if we consider now the distributions of the theta angle for the isolated structures, we notice that while the naked receptor in isolation, so the orange uh, distribution, uh, overlaps with the active conformation, in the case of the glycosylated structure of the receptor in isolation, this never happens, which means that the receptor are and the, sorry that the glycans are actually selecting between active and inactive or suggest that the, the glycans might select between active and inactive conformations and this uh, is related to the fact that during these trajectories the glycans form these bridges among them uh, with a fuzzy fashion so these uh, bridges are not steady but they instead they alternately form in this form and uh, and this is particularly non-trivial because they do not represent uh, an imp a steric impediment to the motion of the receptor, but they rather, uh, via these fuzz interactions, seem to uh, keep the receptor more compact and also impede to the immunoglobulin-like domain to freely orientate in space, for instance, towards this direction when uh, the receptor is isolated. So. Uh, to, con to, let's say, summarize, uh, we have found that the glycans uh, seem to select between active and inactive conformation or allow this selectivity, then, and that the angle uh, theta is actually an optimal discriminant for active and inactive conformations for the upper uh, region of the ectodomain, and finally, that the active conformation it can be identified with a theta of uh, around 110 degrees. And now, for the outlook, uh, so for the uh, research that I'm now carrying out, um, I want to start, like, I want to describe it to you, starting from this uh, conformation, configuration, sorry, that I observed for the, um, for the isolated receptor, fully glycosylated. As you see here, the glycans seem to stretch on the top, or actually are stretching from on the top of the SEMA domain. But then if you imagine that this receptor is actually connected to this portion, is connected to the rest of the chain, and this chain is then connected to the membrane, then it seems that these glycans are actually stretching toward the surface of the membrane so that um, they might interact in similarly as they do between themselves, for instance, with gangliosides. There are glycans, glycosphingolipids, so they have this glycan head that has um, it's a composition that is similar to one of the glycans termini, and uh, uh, they might interact in, with the same fuzzy fashion, so, uh, and also in this way influence the dynamics of the wall ectodomy of the receptor. At the same time, looking at also other players of the plasma membrane as for receptors, we notice that this conformation of the or the, this uh, structure of the yeah this, let's say this conformation of the uh, receptor chain uh, seems to have uh, a strong similarity with the um, with the conformation assumed the inactive conformation assumed by the uh, integrins that are in particular alpha integrins that has that have also a strong structural affinity with the uh, CMET receptor. Uh, so my research is going towards this direction and I want to investigate so the role of the glycans, the participation of the glycans in the lateral organization of the receptor, their effect on the dynamics of the wall ectodomain, and finally also to understand, to identify the dimeric conformation of the homodimer formed by the CMET internal MB complexes. And I'm going to do this exploiting uh, atomistic MD simulations, although I'm also exploiting uh, the uh, coarse grain simulations uh, for uh, this task in particular, so the, the identification of the dimer. Uh, and uh, we are going also to uh, integrate our data, and we are actually already did partly this, uh, with FRED data coming from ex our experimental collaborators from Michael Elman's group. And that is all. Thank you all. And I want to thank all the people of my group and friends also, and all the institutions there on one side fund me and uh, provide me the computational sources, the resources. Thank you all.
thank you very much, Serena. Thank you all the speaker. And now uh, we I want you participant to ask question. So please use, uh, uh, so if you can use the bottom, on the bottom you find the Q&A function and it can be this or this according to your operating system. And uh, you can start to, to type your question and uh, Marta that is chairing the section will read the, for the speaker. So I invite people to do that. Maybe in a while we are speaking and waiting that people start to type, I can I have a couple of uh, I have a couple of questions. And I will start with uh, Rachel. I was wondering, do you know I have two questions. One, how computationally, which have computational advantage we have to use your approach against other shape? Based approach. The advantages. Yeah, uh, the computational cost. It will go down. Yeah. yeah. It will be expensive um, or it will be go down. How much do you have an estimation? Um, they're relatively quick. So I think compared to the other two that I had said, the atomic distance based ones are quicker, but they're not quite as good at producing good hits. Um, our ones are on a comparable time, so maybe just a second or so more. Um, they're quite a bit faster than the ones that are more accurate. Um, so it sits somewhere in the middle of the two. Uh, so roughly for one compound, what is the time that you expect? Depending on the size of the molecule, two or three seconds. Two or three so seconds. Oh, okay, this is pretty quick. Standard desktop PC as well. Um, okay. So the aim is to have it accessible to wet lab researchers that might not have access to high performance computing. Okay, and you spoke about a lot of the advantage of your approach. Do you see any limitation? Yes, so the main one is that we can't look at macrocycles. and um, anything with a hole in the middle of it is oh, off limits. Okay. Um, and this dependency on which atom do we start from um, might lead to some limitations as well. So because the description is better around the point that we start from, if you get that point in the wrong place, you might discount things as not being similar when they actually are. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. I see popping up question, please, Marta. Yeah, Shravan uh, wants to uh, ask uh, by voice, let's say, so go ahead. Yeah, uh, so it was nice uh, presentations. And I have a question for uh, Serena that in the last talk, Serena mentioned that she's going to use the FRET uh, fluorescence uh, that experiment to validate uh, her study. So how she will going to uh, validate that study using the FRET uh, and comparison with the molecular dynamics? So we are going to, we are actually using the FRET to um, identify the distances between uh, uh, some residues uh, of, in particular, the internally B proteins, and use these ones to guide our research of the uh, monomer form, so the, sorry, of the dimer uh, alignment, because we are, uh, let's say, triangulating the, um, the uh, position of the two internal in B with respect to each other, and these known how the internal B binds to the receptor will lead us to understand uh, the uh, which uh, dimeric conformations we get from the coarse grain simulations that I mentioned will be accepted or actually fitting this data. So this is our approach. Okay, uh, so uh, that's good. So now, I mean, which uh, uh, techniques, I mean, intrinsically fluorescence or extrinsically, are you going to use any dyes to label that your uh, residues and then you are going to measure the uh, fluorescence of uh, FRED? So is it intrinsically or uh, extrinsically? Uh, the FRED experiments are done with dyes. There are, uh, so they have mutated the residues on the internal in B protein and uh, are uh, doing the, uh, let's say, the uh, experiments, uh, I would say extrinsically, uh, if I understood what you meant. We are not doing these uh, by simulations. They are actually doing experiments and then we use their data for, uh, let's say, checking our, uh, this, the dimeric conformations that we observe from the simulations. Okay, thank you. Thank you. 
So we have uh, another question for uh, Rachel. Um, they say, thank you for all the nice talks. And then the question is, do you have some examples of the other properties you would like to analyze in the future besides shape similarity? Yes, we do. Um, so that's actually something that a lot of the other shape similarity methods have done as well. Um, so the standard thing to look at is things like count of hydrogen bond donors, hydrogen bond acceptors, number of aromatic rings, so typical things that would potentially influence binding. Um, or you can look at putting the electrostatic potential on top of the shape similarity as well. Thank you, Rachel. So people can ask more questions. I also allow you to raise hands. So if someone wants to talk at Stravan, uh, you can raise your hand and we'll allow you to talk. Uh, I have a question for Costanza. Costanza, you explained very nicely, you know, like the different steps of how one uh, subunit goes and then the other one and then they get mm -hmm. together. But you don't have, how, how to say, the full form, form yet. So can I just ask you, how do you envision it? What do you think will be like the next steps? What are your, you know, working hypotheses? If yeah, you want it's to a nice like question that? because uh, when you lack experimental data, you <laughs> cannot say if... Uh, what you are seeing on your simulation is reliable or not. But uh, we have the, actually we have the pore um, crystal structure of the entire complex and so the pre-pore. So we have some information about uh, how the heterodimer can, can form from this, but uh, not uh, the preliminary uh, stages. So not about the formation of the, so, uh, we suppose that uh, that uh, exposed interface uh, could be uh, maybe a good uh, interface also for dimerization. But of course, we we also have to to try different uh, possible conformation. So this is yeah, uh, the probably the most difficult point to <laughs> to face. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have. Uh, couple more questions for uh, Serena. Uh, how do you think this could be interesting when talking to experts in clinical settings? Can you envision a way this could be relevant for the treatment prevention of listeriosis? So I think that the um, that our research will, um, let's say, the aim is to uh, understand the activation mechanism, especially for what concerns the ectodomain. And normally, uh, uh, growth factor receptors are all targeted uh, with inhibitors that attack the tyrosine kinase that is inside the cell instead. So I think it would be particularly interesting to develop therapies. So from the point of view of the clinical setting, uh, that inhibit instead the activation of the ectodomain. Also, because there is, um, let's say, uh, inhibiting the tyrosine kinase uh, is not always optimal uh, in the sense of tyrosine kinases, uh, like not only the growth factor receptor has the uh, hepatocyte growth factor receptor, so the CMET has a tyrosine kinase, so it's hard to be selective. Instead, the ectodomain is specific for receptors, so it should be uh, a more selective therapy in this sense. Uh, Stravan, you raise your hand. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a question for uh, Rachel uh, that uh, she has uh, used the uh, new uh, SEP similarity approaches to find a based uh, drug molecule for the uh, protein. So uh, the question is, uh, did she use any experimental techniques to validate uh, her results? Not yet. Um, we would hope eventually when we go on to do sort of real drug project, we would then pass the results that we get back to the wet lab chemists. And um, at the moment, it's just a kind of initial case study of would this in theory work? And um, so we've not done any experimental validation yet. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rachel. So we have another question for Costanza. Are there experimental data on the interactions between the proteins and the membrane? Uh, yes, there are interact, uh, experimental data about that. Uh, for example, when I uh, talked about uh, um, the fact that uh, um, Thomas, the postdoc, made uh, uh, ran this simulation for the single monomer uh, that binded the membrane, he uh, could compare his uh, result uh, because he used different kind of membranes. 
um, with the uh, experiments that uh, were also held here in Trento and with uh, some uh, using some vesicles, so model membranes, uh, vesicles with uh, some uh, fluorescent calcine inside. And so the, we can say the action of the gamma molysin was, uh, so the uh, citolytic activity was measured uh, uh, with this kind of fluorescent experiments because uh, the gamma molysin makes pores on the membrane. And so uh, its activity was measured by measuring uh, the, uh, the fluorescence, we can say. Uh, so for the specific uh, interaction between uh, the proteins and the membrane, so they were found, uh, have been found some, um, we can say pivotal uh, residues uh, on the rim domain of the UCAF. Um, and also uh, with uh, the simulations, uh, Thomas uh, found other two um, binding sites. So one is, uh, we can say, uh, in line with uh, the experimental one, and the other one wasn't uh, uh, still uh, detected. Okay, but this is not an experiment. But we can say that uh, he, he was able to see a bit more. Thank you, Constanza. Um, another question for you. Have you compared the homolysin structure with other homolysins, maybe to see any subtle di differences that can have an impact? Uh, no, I haven't personally. Uh, but uh, the fact is now I would be interested in um, heterodimer conformations. Uh, I know that there is a kind of uh, gamma homolysin, which uh, uh, actually um, forms uh, uh, heterodimers in solutions and not single dimers that, and then these heterodimers can find. So maybe uh, it could be useful to compare, uh, to use this kind of uh, structure, even though, um, of course, uh, maybe also to, to see what, uh, yeah, probably yeah, it, it would be useful and I will do this. Even though this kind of heterodimers, if it can be formed in solution, uh, it has some kind of differences, of course, but maybe to see which are those differences uh, could be could be useful. Thank you. And um, uh, Shravan, you have your hand raised again. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question for Costanza that uh, she's investigating the uh, pore formations and using this heterodimer. So I, I don't know much about it, but uh, after finding that how the pore is formed and uh, she will investigate. What is the target? How, I mean, uh, we can use to target uh, the toxins. What is the applications of that by doing these all structural investigations and uh, okay. uh, well, for well, that? The fact is that these toxins are released mainly by bacteria during bacteria pathogenesis. So uh, the main, uh, the main, uh, we can say the aim would be to, to prevent uh, these uh, toxins to the binding, for example, if uh, we know the uh, which are the, the the binding sites of the protein, uh, or uh, also what uh, what can uh, causes uh, the uh, conformational changes. Uh, so the the major aim uh, would be to uh, to to prevent the formation of the toxins, uh, the the pore. So maybe. Uh, Eventually, uh, research like this uh, could uh, lead to the de development of uh, some uh, some drugs. So, if we can find a proper target. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'm gonna leave it for one more question. Rachel, I have a question for you. So you talked about you will benchmark your tool. Can you tell us a little bit about, more about that? So how you, will you do it against some other tools or just against the best tool or yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so it will be against the same methods that I've presented for the sort of little table um, of just using three PD5 inhibitors with the exception of the chemical fingerprint method. Um, so the a gold standard benchmarking set is the same one that's used with a lot of docking the directory useful decoys. That's 102 different protein targets with a set of actives and sort of presumed inactives for each target. Um, and we'll sort of run through those and see um, how well the method does identifying true actives compared to the decoys. 
you can't use that for the 2D fingerprints because there's an inherent 2D bias in the data. Um, <laughs> so it's too easy a problem for them. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I think we'll uh, leave it here today. Thank you very much to all the speakers and thank you very much to all the attendees for having been with us uh, today. Uh, see you another time. Bye.